Okay, so our topic for this evening will be uh, hair pulling and OCD, or rather uh, somewhat more broadly, body-focused repetitive behaviors in general and their relationship to OCD. Uh, we will talk about similarities, we'll talk about differences, um, and we'll talk about different aspects. Let me actually go over to the content and then I'll tell you exactly what we'll talk about. The, we will talk about it kind of by comparing OCD to hair pulling. Um, so I will be talking about OCD and then commenting how it's similar or different from, from BFRBs. The reason why I chose to structure the webinar in this way is because most of you are here because you already know from experience what hair pulling is. So I don't need to give you the definition of it. And then, so we can unpack OCD and then see where they overlap or where they don't. Obviously, I'll tell you about what exactly that is, as always. Then we'll talk about OCD as a spectrum versus just one entity. We'll talk about um, how BFRBs overall relate to OCD. And then we'll talk a little bit about genetics, about neurobiology, and different treatment options. Uh, we will compare and contrast them. Uh, one of the topics that I've, I'm interested in and that I know you all are is kind of the neuro, the brain science behind um, behind BFRBs. But we've never had that, I believe, as, as a separate topic. It's simply because there really isn't that much material out there. Uh, so uh, it's hard to create a webinar out of kind of scattered papers here and there. But this is actually a very good, I think, moment to compare and contrast because there is quite substantial research on OCD. So we can see whether those scattered findings that we have for BFRBs actually align or don't align with what we know about OCD. So that's what we will talk about uh, this evening. Uh, I wanted to start with just a short tribute to Freud uh, simply because we get the word, the name OCD from him. Um, he wrote a paper called Notes Upon a Case of Obsessional Neurosis, and that's basically when we kind of started considering OCD as a, as a special entity. It was obviously discussed before by Janet and Morel and all these other really big names in psychiatry, but always as usually as a kind of subtype of something else, of some kind of neurasthenia and other conditions such as that. But Freud kind of took it and said, no, no, this is a, a separate entity. And in fact, the, the very beginning of psychoanalysis is deeply connected to OCD, which is one more reason I, to mention him. I won't go into details about Freud. Uh, maybe, you know, some other time in, in, in a more appropriate context, I would love to, because uh, I do have great admiration for the man. Um, but here, I would just kind of like to point out that um, his one of the first papers that showed that psychoanalysis works and that it can actually alleviate suffering was, uh, it, it's kind of what put psychoanalysis on the map. Um, it's his case called the Rat Man. Uh, th this very unflattering nickname came out of a dream that his patient had. And that patient had what we would today call OCD and what he called obsessional neurosis. Of course, like everything else Freud did, this was criticized and disputed later on. Although I think all of his case reports, quite honestly, are well worth reading because um, they're quite fascinating. So this is where kind of it all starts. So it's just a brief um, homage, if you will, to, to Freud. Because I find that we frequently criticize him and I'll be a little mean and say that many people who criticize him don't actually read any psychoanalysis. So their criticism is usually superficial, but I think we owe quite a lot to Freud. He can be rightfully criticized on many points, but we do owe quite a lot to him because he invented in large part the language that we speak today. So if nothing else, then we use his words, even if we give them a different meaning. Obviously in his time, he thought he was being scientific. In, by today's standards, I don't think psychoanalysis passes the, the, the test as a science, but it is still worth kind of mentioning that he has a place and, and that's all, all I'm going to say about him. 
Uh, now let's just jump into the into the practical stuff. Uh, I would like to maybe one day talk more about Freud's understanding of OCD because it is rather interesting. Uh, but today we're going to lean more on the um, on the sciencey side of things rather than the psychological side of things. Uh, so, what exactly is OCD? So, what are what do we talk about when we talk about OCD? So, it it's it's a condition primarily characterized by two things, right? One is intrusive thoughts, and not just any intrusive thoughts, but thoughts that create a lot of distress in those that experience them, and then those thoughts lead to compulsions or rituals which have this goal of alleviating somehow those thoughts of making them go away right they as this definition here says the rituals are to compensate for the ego dystonic feelings of the obsessional thoughts and can cause significant decline in function uh, so this decline in function is quite important and it's also important for hair pulling as well um, the, meaning that uh, for something to be a disorder, it actually has to affect your daily functioning. Uh, otherwise, you probably wouldn't consider it a problem. Ego dystonic in this definition just means that it doesn't feel like it's yours. The opposite of ego dystonic is ego syntonic. And when something is ego syntonic, it means that you don't feel it as a symptom. It, you just feel it as a part of you. Whereas with OCD, intrusive thoughts are not something that you choose to think. It's not something you want to have. It's just something that keeps kind of barging into your, your consciousness. So they're very, very much unwelcome guests. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about intrusive thoughts that create a lot of distress and then about rituals and compulsions that are meant to make those thoughts go away. This entire cycle has to cause a decline in function or rather it has to cause problems for you in your everyday life. The reason why this is important is because sometimes uh, with OCD and also with hair pulling, uh, we can kind of align between what is, let's say, quote unquote, normal. The more I'm in, in this field, the less I feel that normal exists, but let's use the word you know, for, for now. And what is OCD? That line can sometimes be blurred, and you will see why once I kind of show you some very f common types of, of OCD, I think it will become quite clear. And also with hair pulling, let, let's use that as an example. Um, and BFRBs in general, it also works for skin picking. Uh, sometimes um, a certain amount of grooming is socially acceptable and culturally acceptable. So, in, so let's say, um, picking one pimple or pulling one hair if it's rough or like for, let, let's consider grooming eyebrows especially for women I think culture sends a lot of mixed messages and then sometimes we find ourselves in these very gray areas when is it that something is grooming something that is um, culturally and psychologically okay for the person and then where is it where that it becomes that it becomes a problem Right, so this is why this this is why this decline in function is so deeply important here. Uh, when I went to medical school, which wasn't a very long time ago, but it was before DSM five. Well, come to think of it, maybe it was a long time ago, um, because DSM five came in two thousand and thirteen, and I I had already graduated when it, when it came out. Um, but my point being is that when I went to medical school, uh, I was taught that uh, OCD is just one of the anxiety disorders. That's how it was classified. And then with DSM-5, it was removed from that category and put in its own category. So today we talk about obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So it has its own entire group. Within this group, except obviously aside from OCD, we have BDD or body dysmorphic disorder, something that we frequently see with people who pull their hair or pick their skin. And then we have the hoarding disorder, and then we have BFRBs as well. So they all fall into the category of obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So just to be clear, hair pulling is not OCD, but it is related to OCD. They kind of fall into the same basket, 
we talk about OCD spectrum nowadays more and more. And I personally quite like this, uh, for one, because of that blurred boundary that I mentioned. And second of all, because sometimes uh, you get several BFRBs in one person at the same time. Sometimes you have OCD and BFRBs coexisting. Sometimes they really are very much mixed together and it's difficult to say where one stops and the other one begins. Here's a quote from, the, from this paper. You have a screenshot here and you can find the whole paper online for free, I think. Uh, it says like this, it has become apparent that these disorders, meaning everything within the OCD spectrum, can also be viewed as being on a continuum of compulsivity to impulsivity, characterized by harm avoidance at the compulsive end and risk seeking at the impulsive end. The compulsive and impulsive disorder differ in systematic ways that are just beginning to be understood. Meaning we can tell that these are quite similar but why? We have no idea, right? Uh, I think this is, this is a very good way of looking at OCD uh, because here, just from this sentence here, you can see how some things might align with hair pulling, whereas in some other aspects, it might differ. So for example, when we talk about avoidance at one end of the spectrum and then impulsivity at the other, this really, if you, if you examine, at least most of you, if you examine your experience, you'll see that sometimes, and you know this if you've been to my other webinars, that sometimes we look at hair pulling as being an avoidance strategy, as something that is done so that you wouldn't have to deal with certain private experiences, such as um, memories or painful feelings or difficult thoughts and so on. So that would be the one end where you're desperately trying to avoid something. And then on the other end, uh, we see the impulsivity when the urge comes and snap before you even know it, you're pulling, right? So th th here we can find elements where, where hair pulling could fit in both categories. But on the other hand, um, well, actually, let me go to the next slide and then maybe I'll have a chance to elaborate that here. Um, I wanted to add another difference, but I think it might be better if I mention that here. So here's how we, how we diagnose OCD. So it needs to obviously have presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. And let's take a look at how they're defined. And then we can see what's similar and what's different. So there are two criteria for both. For obsessions, it's the following. So they have to be recurrent thoughts, urges, or images sometimes that cause disturbance and that are unwanted. So that's one, uh, that's one criterion. And the second one is that, that the individual attempts to suppress these thoughts or urges, so to get rid of them, through some other thought or action, or rather replacing them with a compulsion or a ritual. So those are obsessions. The key here is that these are thoughts or urges that come without you inviting them. So it's not something that you actively think. Uh, it's something that you actually actively don't want to think. And it's something that causes you great distress just because it's there in your mind, right? We have a lot of thoughts that come to our mind and then go, and we don't really react to them. So these thoughts wouldn't be obs obsessions, even though we don't, um, we don't invite them or can't control them. So they have to cause distress and we have to fight them through a thought or an action. So that, that would be an obsession. Uh, a compulsion, um, Sorry, just one second, something weird is blinking on the screen. Okay, a compulsion is also defined by two different points. So you have to have repetitive behaviors or mental acts in response to an obsession. That kind of builds on the, on the end here of what, how we defined an obsession. And then the behaviors or, or mental acts have to be aimed at reducing anxiety or distress or preventing some situation, right? So you have to uh, do a certain thing five times so that you don't cause an earthquake, right? So there has to also be this, uh, this element of it not being realistic. Uh, however, I kind of take issue with this way of phrasing it because I think what's realistic really defines on the paradigm that you accept 
as as kind of being the constraints of reality, right? So someone who is religious and someone who is not religious, for example, will have widely different definitions of what's realistic and what they can expect. But the key, I think the, the takeaway message is the spirit here is that, that compulsions in some way have to seem unreasonable to a person. To an outsider, a lot of things can seem unreasonable. So that's not something that we necessarily have to look at. So if we consider how this is similar, we can see that, well, rather we can see that it is both similar and different from skin picking. So very frequently when people talk about, uh, sorry, I meant to say hair pulling. When people talk about hair pulling, they will tell me I feel the urge and then I pull my hair, right? So uh, sometimes they will say I feel the urge and it's gradual. And sometimes they will say, I feel the urge and it just comes about very suddenly and there's no space for thinking. I just immediately need to pull. So that way it is, and, and then if I resist, it will continue to come back. Or the same goes about for thoughts. You will maybe have a thought that you need to check what your hair looks like, or you might touch a hair and see that it's rough. And then thoughts might be coming back to you all the time. Oh, now I need to think about, I need to pull this hair. I need to pull this hair. I need to pull this hair, right? These thoughts can be unwanted and can feel very obsessive. So in this regard, in some cases, it is quite similar to how people experience hair pulling. But at the same time, it's also very different because there is always that automatic aspect to hair pulling. Sometimes people pull hair, their hair without feeling an urge or at least without being aware of it. Uh, without having any recurrent thoughts, it can just happen while you engage in an activity. Also, the purpose of pulling is not always to make the thoughts go away. In some instances, it is. But sometimes it's also because it alleviates anxiety. So that's just one part of the definition here. So not entirely compulsive. Whereas at other times, it actually seems to have this function of helping people focus. Uh, and this is something that people will tell me, like I'm overwhelmed with thoughts or I ruminate or I have too much on my plate. And then I pull. And then when I pull, I will, um, I will feel better. I will focus more easily. Sometimes pulling is a reward. In that case, it, it doesn't have neither the obsessive nor the compulsive component. So you can see how it's similar. And it overlaps at in some instances, but it's kind of a different thing. So it is fair to talk about it, I would say, as a spectrum, just not the same entities. When they overlap, it can be quite a challenge to differentiate between the two. But because we're allowed to talk about it as a spectrum, uh, in some cases, we don't actually even need to set very fixed boundaries, especially in psychotherapy. When it comes to pharmacological treatment, that's a different matter, and I will address that later on. Uh, but this kind of gives us gives us the um, the ability when we look at it as a spectrum. It gives us the ability to discuss with clients what is it that they consider to be a problem, and what is it that they don't consider to be a problem. Because some people will think that every form of pulling is a problem always. Other people will say, well, I'm okay with this pulling, but I'm not okay with this other type of pulling. And in that case, we can really disregard any kind of normative um, judgments because what ultimately matters is that you are content with your life and that you suffer a little less. So when we look at all this as a spectrum, it gives us a lot more freedom in psychotherapy. As you can see, I'm looking at this from the point of view of a therapist, not a researcher. Because ultimately, to me, if something is not clinically relevant, as amusing as I may find a theory or an interesting an article or whatever finding, I don't know what to do with it unless I can use it in therapy, right? Here are some other criteria that OCD has to satisfy. First, this is something I've mentioned before. Obsessions have to be time-consuming and cause significant distress. So if it doesn't impair your functioning, it may not be a problem. And the same goes for hair pulling. If you actually don't mind your hair pulling, then it's not a problem, or at least not yet, although it may become one, right? Uh, obsessive compulsive symptoms should not arise from psych the psychological effects of a substance or another medical condition. 
This is quite important. Uh, for example, when it comes to hair pulling, perhaps not as much. Although we know that sometimes uh, hair pulling can be associated with the effects of some medications. For example, in some instances, ADHD medication will reduce pulling. In some other instances, it will make it worse. Um, so in that case, it might actually be uh, better to see if the, the, the drug can be substituted or the dose adjusted. Um, and then it shouldn't be due to another medical condition. So when, when it comes to uh, hair pulling, the thing that comes to my mind is anemia. We know that in some types of anemia, sometimes hair pulling might happen due to anemia, although the exact connection is not, not quite clear. Um, and we know that, for example, OCD or what appears to be OCD can actually be um, just one aspect of Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease. Uh, so we have to we have to eliminate all these neurological and other uh, causes. It has to remain, let's say, psychological. And then obviously it should be the best fit that we cannot find any other way, better way to conceptualize the problem. So those would be the diagnostic criteria. And hopefully you can see how hair pulling shares some of these, but then also really differs and sometimes quite significantly. Here are the most common uh, obsessions that we see. Uh, the first one is by far the most common one that I see in my practice. It may not be for everywhere and it's not an absolute number. I'm just talking about my psychotherapeutic practice. It's the contamination obsession. So uh, thinking about dirt, different infections, infectious agents, body fluids and such. And this is where you can find some overlap with BFRBs, although a little more with skin picking than with hair pulling, where sometimes people will pick their skin to remove what they perceive to be impurities or, or dirt, right? We have sexual obsessions, which are quite frequent, violent obsessions, scrupulosity, which just means religious and moral OCD. And this is also one of those gray areas, depending on the religion that you belong to or the subtype of religion that you belong to or how religious you are, you might have a schedule like when you have to pray, for example. And if you skip that or cannot maintain it, you might feel terribly anxious. But this is not because you have OCD. This is because you're breaking a religious rule. So it, we have to be very, very careful not to pathologize normal behavior and people's values. But sometimes religious and moral concerns can be obsessive and can lead to compulsions. So this is a very touchy area. Identity obsessions as well. Um, obsessions about one's sexual identity or gender identity. Whereas here, I don't mean um, like legitimately questioning how you see yourself. This is something that we all practically go through. Uh, most people question their sexual identity, at least at some point while they're growing up. This is a normal part of living. Uh, we're not talking about this. We're talking about unwanted thoughts that question this obsessively. So we're not talking about someone kind of realizing something about themselves or or reflecting on whatever, their feelings, attractions, and so on. So we're talking about something that intrudes into your awareness. Uh, obsessions about responsibility and perfectionism related obsessions. This is also one area where we can perhaps see some relation to, to body focus repetitive behaviors. Um, however, um, I wouldn't necessarily think of it as being the same as OCD, um, specifically because the way I see the role of, of um, BFRBs here is, is more complex. Uh, sometimes someone wants to have a perfect smooth skin, so they will pick their skin. Uh, sometimes uh, you might want to get rid of all your rough hairs. But this is not always the case because sometimes um, it's not that the rough hairs are a bother as much as um, I'm struggling to phrase it actually precisely. Um, well, let me put it this way. Uh, perfectionist tendencies tend to generate a lot of anxiety. And then uh, hair pulling can be an outlet for that anxiety. It's not a way to get rid of perfectionism. 
more like collateral damage from perfectionism. I hope that makes sense. I feel like it's a very complex re relationship that's kind of hard to outline very uh, briefly. We have the most common compulsions uh, in OCD here. So washing and cleaning would be one, checking, repeating, mental compulsions, uh, praying, counting, preparing things, arranging things in a specific order. So here, um, I, I, I don't think that you can count necessarily pulling as being terribly similar to these, although touching one's hair can be. That is a part that can feel, can feel very compulsive. It can feel almost like your hand is out of control, not even compulsive, but even more than that. So it's in this end, in how you deal with the with, with thoughts and urges, that you can see the main difference. However, one thing on a very obvious superficial level, and this will be important later on, that you can see is that the, the common thing that they share, OCD and BFRBs, is repetition. And we will go over some, some neurobiological findings. And I wonder if this aspect of repetition is what makes them similar even on this level as well. That they can have different causes and different consequences and different mechanisms, but still, still appear quite similar because they involve uh, a certain aversion to emotions, um, certain patterns of thinking, and then, um, and then repetition in, in behavior. So what causes OCD? And let me add another question there. What causes hair pulling? If we're being completely honest, the, the only answer is that we have absolutely no idea. In fact, we have too many ideas, which is why we don't really have the full picture. This is in general a problem, I would say, with psychiatry as such. It tries very hard to move towards the biological, uh, almost to pretend to be more scientific than it actually is. But in all these years of research, we really have zero comprehensive, coherent, consistent models for anything. And that includes OCD. Even though there is quite a lot of research and there are some very convincing and good ideas, we can't say this is our biological model. Also from the psychological side, which is the side that for practical reasons, I'm more inclined, I'm not a researcher, I am a therapist, but even from the psychological point of view for either OCD or BFRBs, we can say here, we have this one theory, take it. We have many theories. We can think of it as experiential avoidance. We can think of it as, as a habit. We can think of it as an expression of suppressed sexual and aggressive impulses that Freud might kind of refer to. So there are many ways. And then usually what we do is we choose one paradigm that works for us. Or if you're eclectic like me, then you will try to learn about as many of them as you can and see what fits the client. But we don't have one theory that we can go by. So I'm going to go over more of the psych of the of the biological theories today because usually I talk about the psychological stuff so I want to give you a different perspective and see if there's anything practical that we can learn from it but <clears throat> sorry overall if you have one one key takeaway is that honestly we just don't know right so this is really very important um a few things here um we should probably address genetics for both uh, hair pulling and um, and OCD. Uh, and we should address neurobiology and then some other small things along the way. For OCD, we know that genetics may play a role. For example, we know that identical twins are more likely to develop OCD than non-identical twins. This is quite important because it literally says if you have identical DNA, you're more likely to end up with the same problem than if you don't. However, uh, we can't say there's this one gene and when you have this version of that gene, you get OCD. We can't say that. We have some studies that isolate some genes and they've studied them, but we don't really have one thing to say this is what causes it. We know that if you have a parent or a sibling with OCD, that's a risk factor 
right? But saying that something is a risk factor doesn't mean that you're going to get it. It doesn't mean that you've inherited it. This is, this is really an important point. When I work with clients, I tend to intentionally downplay genetics because in psychotherapy, I don't see that many useful things about it. Uh, researchers, doctors, psychologists, whoever, might have a different interpretation of genetics than other people do. What when people find when my clients find online because they engage in the dangerous practice of googling things, and then they find their worst fear and present it to me, uh, they will usually say, "There you go. I found that my hair pulling is genetic, so you know, <laughs> it is what it is." And to me, this is a very restricting, restrictive way of looking at things, especially because we know that it is not, it is what it is, right? You can have, you can pull your hair, but your children don't have to. You can have OCD, but your children don't have to. The same way that in other areas of medicine, uh, we can have a predisposition, we can have risk factors, but it doesn't mean that we actually have to develop that condition. To give you a very practical personal example, both of my parents have heart problems. Uh, they both had heart attacks. Both of my grandfathers died from heart attacks. Um, one of my grandmothers had heart problems as well. So I know that I have risk factors, quite a few of them. Probably there is a genetic, genetic component to that. But I don't have high blood pressure. I don't have any heart problems. And this is because I take care of myself. So even if there is a risk factor, you can still do quite a lot to mitigate it. But when, when we read newspaper articles and they say, aha, the gene has been discovered for OCD or this or that, we just kind of tend to surrender to it. So this is why I downplay the role. But if we're strictly talking about numbers, for OCD, it is considered that about uh, up to 65, this is about 30 to 65% of the cases may have some genetic input to them. So there is this element as well, but don't take that as, as, a, as something that should discourage you. Uh, as far as uh, hair pulling goes, we have very little data. Uh, the studies that I've seen have very small sample sizes, which means that we can't really extrapolate much from them. Uh, and they usually find correlations. And correlations are notoriously really uh, difficult to work with because correlation just means that two variables will kind of move or change in a similar way. They will follow a similar, similar trend. But it doesn't mean that one causes the other. So just because we find a correlation, it really doesn't mean that there's anything there. Uh, in addition, um, Grooming uh, and hair pulling can be seen as a kind of grooming gone awry. Uh, grooming is, is normal and it's present in birds as well, in chickens and whatever you want. So all kinds of animals groom themselves. So it, it is kind of logical to assume that there is some sort of genetic basis to it. The same way that whatever we do or think, it's reasonable to assume that something occurs in our brain but just because something occurs in our brain doesn't mean that that's necessarily pathological. It just is a reflection of something that is happening. So we have to be very careful how we understand these things. For OCD, it is fair to say that there is a genetic component. For BFRBs, we can say that there's really no solid evidence for it, but because grooming is present in other species, and um, I've read in some books that people will say that animals can have BFRBs, I, I think this is a slightly bizarre statement to make. We can perhaps observe what we think of as excessive grooming, but I have no idea what a subject, what subjective experience of a bird is like. So I wouldn't necessarily think that a bird has a problem with how it grooms itself. So it's it's kind of iffy, but definitely we can notice excessive grooming that that I can I, I can agree with. So in that sense, it's not it's not impossible to think of it as having a genetic aspect, but not necessarily that it's caused by this. I'm saying this for two reasons. First, so that you don't get discouraged. And second, so that, you do, you know, so that you're not terrified that your child might pull their hair as well. Uh, and there's also another thing, which is why I put this question mark here, which is that when we 
talk about genetics, we're frequently just observing patterns that are transmitted through generations. We now know that there are ways to transmit something without that being genetic. For example, a lot of epigenetic research has shown that um, you can have a tendency towards something and that this can be inherited from your parents or grandparents, but it's not genetic because it doesn't actually alter your genes. It just alters the, how your genes are expressed. So it's epigenetic. And this is something that we can work with. This is by no means something that you have to be stuck with for the rest of your life, right? Uh, there, there is quite, a, there's some research in this area now and quite fascinating research, I will say, not without its critics, but then again, you can't really break new ground without being criticized. Um, there is a, a researcher called, I believe, Rachel Yehuda. Uh, she's from New York. Um, she does research on Holocaust survivors and their offsprings. And she showed, for example, that you can pass on the trauma to your offsprings. Uh, and some, some studies that I've read even involve transmitting memories to an extent. Um, we don't know exactly how this occurs, but it is not genetic, it's epigenetic. So that much we know, right? So you can basically inherit a tendency towards being more anxious or being more depressed, which is what she showed, that, that uh, offsprings of Holocaust survivors tend to have higher rates of anxiety or depression. And that even in some instances, uh, how their, um, how their uh, corticosteroid uh, secretion functions, so how their adrenal glands work uh, is actually not the same as people who don't have, uh, who don't have uh, ancestors who were in the Holocaust, even if they're Jewish. So they've kind of included all these variables and shown that this is specifically related to someone having experienced a trauma. So not everything that we inherit has to be genetic. And then furthermore, if you ask any family therapist anywhere in the world, they will tell you that we learn patterns and perpetuate patterns all the time without having to be genetic. So you can see something in yourself, in your mom or your dad, grandparents, and it doesn't have to be genetic. It can actually be internalized or learned behavior something that you've seen them do and you may or may not remember it, but then you kind of just take it on and it, it gets a life of its own within you. There are numerous patterns like that. Not, not all of them are problematic, but this is also a potential explanation. Uh, stressful life events can trigger both OCD and hair pulling. However, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to say that a stressful life event can cause OCD or hair pulling. Uh, to give you a, a few practical examples, when the pandemic first started, uh, when was it? 2020, right? Um, immediately in those first months, I had several clients uh, in my practice, who, new clients who came and said, um, well, um, when COVID started, I got OCD. Not all of these clients had OCD that related to contamination as one might expect, but most did. Um, and in that case, when I got to know them, it was kind of clear to me that what, what COVID did was cause this drastic change in how they live and this kind of drastic increase when it comes to contamination fears of, of fears that were already somewhere there in the background. So maybe they were excessively neat before, or they liked order, or, or they were rigid in their thinking in some way. So, or they've somehow organized their life according to very strict rules so that they can feel safe if they experienced a trauma. So there was something there, and then you had this stressful event, and this stressful event suddenly activated it. And this is shared for both OCD and hair pulling. I just don't think it's necessarily fair to say that it's caused by but maybe triggered by, right? The same way that your pulling can be triggered by something, but you know that the cause is probably something deeper than, I don't know, anticipating an argument with someone, right? It's, it's more about what the argument would mean for you. And then strep infections. I don't want to spend too much time on this point here. Uh, but suffice it to say that some researchers um, uh, think that a strep infection can cause an autoimmune response, which can then lead uh, to OCD in children 
and then later on as, as they grow up in adulthood as well. Uh, this is not something that everyone agrees on, but then again, as I said, fundamentally, we have no idea, so I think disagreements are fine. I just wanted to mention this. You can research it for yourself if you find it interesting in some way. So now I would like to explain a little bit about how hair pulling and, um, and OCD are similar or different when it comes to brain function and structure. Uh, here, I, I will have to combine all BFRB research because there simply isn't enough of it. In the beginning, I quoted a paper, if you remember, and in that paper, uh, this concept of OCD spectrum was, was discussed. And one of, the, one of the things that we know about OCD and what we can assume that goes for the whole spectrum is that there are certain functional or structural, uh, I almost said problems, but I don't want to say problems because I don't want to add more pathologizing to this, but let's say it's, it's different ways of uh, different structural or, or functional um, observations that have been made. They all pertain to the frontal cortex, which is what I'm showing you here. So this is the front side of the brain. This here is the cerebellum. So this is the frontal cortex here. Uh, this is the parietal cortex, occipital cortex, and temporal cortex, if you want to orient yourself. Um, so we know from numerous studies that, that are about OCD, that connections between the frontal cortex and something called the striatum in the basal ganglia, you can see it better here. It's this colored part. So it's hidden, it's deep inside the brain. So the connections between this the frontal cortex and the striatum, this part here, that these connections don't seem to function the same way that they do in people who don't have OCD. And in addition, some studies have shown that there are also structural differences in the brain. So something that you can see and measure, but this is not a consistent finding. And this goes for both OCD and BFRBs. Some studies will find these, others won't. So ultimately, either there are several different types or it has to do with duration of the symptoms or severity of the symptoms or, you know, God knows it can be many things, so I can't even guess all of them. But the, the point is that the entire OCD spectrum should have, the, should have a, a, a specificity in, in functioning or structure in this area here. You can really look up hundreds of studies for OCD that will all confirm in one way or another. As I said, some will just find uh, different levels of activity. Others will find that the thickness of the cortex or some uh, subcortical structures that it may differ in people who have or don't have OCD. Uh, when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, uh, BFRBs, specifically one study that I found let me go back to this one. Shows, because it's easier to see. I hope this is not too gross for you because it's a very realistic rendering. It's only in the, in the cerebellum you can see that it's actually not a photograph. It's, it's an image. But one study showed that the uh, frontal inferior gyrus, so this part here, it's part of the prefrontal cortex, is thinner in those subjects that had OCD, that had uh, trichotillomania versus those that didn't have. Uh, but what's important, I'm pointing here to the left side, but it's not the left side. So it's actually the right side, the other side of the brain. This is quite important because, um, so on the left side, we have Broca's area, which is very intimately related to processing speech and language. So not that side, but the right side. The cortex tends to be a little thinner in some of the subjects, in that study in most, but we can't generalize the study. So it's appropriate to say in some people who have trichotillomania, that's thinner. Why, if this has any clinical significance, this is not quite, quite clear, right? Uh, I will explain some parallels later on in just a couple of minutes, but this will be one finding that's related to the frontal cortex, right? So one part of the OCD spectrum, check right there. There are other studies as well. Uh, one study, for example, uh, took a look at these subcortical structures uh, 
and they took a look at uh, both how they function uh, and what they look like. And so for trichotillomania specifically, there were two main findings uh, that, that this, I forgot the authors, I apologize to the authors if they, um, if they're by any chance uh, listening to this. Um, so two main findings there. One, that there is a significant reduction in the volume of the right amygdala. So you don't see it, uh, let me see. Yeah, you don't see amygdala here because the limbic system is not shown definitively, but it's a part of the of the limbic system. It's that it, amygdala means um, where's my Latin where I when I need it? Almond, sorry. So it's about that size and that shape. So that's what it means. Well, amygdala is a is, is plural, so it means almonds. Um, so specifically, a reduction in the volume of the right amygdala and the left striatum. So this specifically this area here, this blue area, I hope you can see where I'm pointing this part here, All right? So this in the middle is called globus pallidus, which is a fancy way of saying a pale globe. And then this part around it here, this is thinner on the, uh, this is thinner on the left side, whereas the amygdala was, was reduced on the right side. So there's a bit of an asymmetry there. So this is one finding that they had for, for those subjects in the study that had trichotillomania. And the second finding was quite interesting to me. And I don't know if it bears, it, this study wasn't repeated. So this is a one-time finding. Possibly other studies wouldn't confirm this, which is a, a morphometric abnormality, meaning that the shape of, of, a, of, of the striatum was changed, specifically in this very big arching structure here. And this is called a uh, caudate nucleus or nucleus caudatus in Latin, which actually just means a nucleus that has a tail because it looks like a tail. You have a bunch of gray cells and you have a tail. That's why it's called nucleus caudatus. Cauda means tail in Latin. So that's what, that was, uh, that was the, the second finding. So the volume was fine. There was nothing wrong with the, the overall size. It's just that the shape was slightly different. This study also took a look at some subjects that had uh, dermatillomania, and there were some findings as well, although they were not, uh, they were not structural findings, but they were functional findings. Uh, what they found was hypoactivation in the dorsal striatum and anterior, anterior cingulate cortex, which uh, and right frontal regions. So anterior, this all sounds, I know, very bizarre, but anterior cingulate cortex, again, part of the limbic system, uh, front, uh, frontal right regions is basically similar, roughly the same place where that thinner cortex was found in another study in trichotillomania. Right? Um, these regions are anatomically kind of close to one another. And there are other studies, although again, with very small samples with people who have dermatillomania and trichotillomania that find some changes in these areas. So here we see the other part of the OCD spectrum and some abnormalities that were identified. In fact, when it comes to skin picking, this one study identifies both parts. So the frontal and the, and the striatum. So both parts, the, the not the same thing, but very, very similar to what we see in OCD. I found one study that compared and contrasted people who have skin picking versus people who pull their hair. And I thought this was quite interesting because they did find some differences. Uh, as you can see, these findings are kind of all over the place. So I thought this would be also very interesting to look at because skin picking and hair pulling are similar, but they're not the same thing again. Um, and so basically what they uh, looked at were brain volume and cortical thickness in this study. And they also controlled for illness severity to make sure that this doesn't interfere with the findings. And those subjects who had uh, dermatillomania or skin picking had greater volume in uh, the ventral striatum bilaterally. So ventral is just another word of saying anterior because we have to invent a whole incomprehensible language to talk in medicine, because that's how we feel smart. Um, when we talk about the brain, we, we won't say anterior, we'll usually say ventral. Of course, it's not that simple, but you know, this is, 
a general population webinar, so allow me to have my fun. But basically, this frontal area is here, this part, and bilaterally, so on both sides. So far, you've seen that a lot of these findings are on the right side, and then sometimes on the left side. But here, when you compare uh, skin picking and hair pulling, you see that those subjects that pick their skin but don't pull their hair have bigger uh, anterior parts of their striatum. So that was that was one very interesting finding to me, at least. And they also found reduced cortical thickness in the right hemisphere in the frontal areas. So this is something that we can say that it's that's already a consistent finding because I've seen it in three different studies. Compared to OCD research, it's absolutely nothing, but it is a decently important finding. Um, so they also found that, that those uh, participants in the study who had trichotillomania but did not pick their skin, that they had reduced thickness of the right parahippocampal area. Um, you can't see that, but you can see it here. Uh, well, it's labeled, so I can't really uh, show off. Here it is here. So uh, those, uh, those study participants with trichotillomania, this part had reduced thickness, so lower volume than those who, who picked their skin. Now, let me explain why I find this so fascinating. I have only seen that in this one study, so maybe never gets repeated, never gets replicated. Because for a lot of these, I think you know, I can invent all these stories why this might be or that might be, but this one actually really seemed interesting to me. I could be completely wrong about the explanation. We need far more research to say anything, but when I read it, there was like a smile on my face because of all things, this part here, uh, what it does is um, that it participates in, in space spatial recognition. So for example, this part helps you remember landscapes. It helps you remember uh, rooms in your house or someone else's house. Uh, it also uh, helps in processing language, but not words themselves, but those, let's say, paraverbal elements of language. So the tone of voice. For example, this is an area that helps us understand sarcasm, according to some researchers. But as far as the language goes, I have no idea how that could possibly connect to BFRBs. But when it comes to when it comes to space, I could completely see that um, because sometimes you know you will have bathroom as being a very risky space, and I can see how this area could maybe play an important role. After all, uh, repetitive behaviors are repetitive behaviors, and we know that neurons that fire together wire together. So it just occurred to me that it's very interesting that it's that the uh, there's that there's um, that there's less cortex in this area that actually talks about spatial recognition, seeing how how BFRBs are kind of uh, constrained to certain spaces, at least in some in some clients. So this is also another finding that we have. And other than to say that this invites further research, I fail to say to see any practical value from it for now. Um, now I would like to say a few words about treatment because this is also an area where we have significant overlap but also significant, significant differences. First of all, OCD responds to both uh, drugs and psychotherapy. So we know that SSRIs will significantly improve um, OCD symptoms. We also know that um, we can perhaps the, we can perhaps supplement SSRI treatment with some antipsychotic drugs like haloperidol or risperidone. Studies have shown in multiple studies at that that these actually really help very well. We also know that for OCD, psychotherapy helps too. All kinds of psychotherapy can be helpful. Combination of psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy also quite helpful. However, when it comes to hair pulling, we can't say the same. In fact, from what we know now, we need more research. So this, I have to make this um, uh, very, oh, someone asked what SSRIs are. So SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is quite a mouthful, uh, but essentially antidepressants. Zoloft, Prozac, those are SSRIs. 
Prozac was actually the first SSRI to ever be created. We have dozens of them on the market, um, but those would be SSRI, so antidepressants. Um, they work well for, they work well, well, they work sometimes for depression. They work uh, decently well for generalized anxiety. They also help with OCD. So we know that, but they do not seem to be very effective when it comes to BFRBs. In fact, in some of the studies that I've seen, they perform worse than placebos. There's, there have been 10, 11, maybe even more drugs and, and more supplements also tested for hair pulling and for skin picking. And none of them seem to have any real efficiency. Uh, they don't seem to be uh, working well. Uh, one thing that does seem to be somewhat helpful for hair pulling um, and skin picking as well is N-acetylcysteine or NAC or NAC, however you want to call it. Um, I guess it's a supplement and it's available over the counter and in higher doses, it seems to reduce the urge to pull, uh, but it only works in about 50% of those who take it. FDA has never approved anything for, for, for body-focused repetitive behaviors. So we have no pharmacological treatment for uh, skin picking or hair pulling. But we do know that psychotherapy works because we know that habit reversal training works and there are multiple studies confirming this. We know that acceptance and commitment therapy works. We know that all kinds, I mean, not all existent kinds of therapies, but many more therapies have been tested and shown to work. So we know that this is, um, that this is something that, that, can be, that can be helpful. And this is where they're similar in terms that they both respond to talk therapy, but only OCD will respond well to pharmacotherapy. This is not necessarily uh, always going to be the case because you never know what breakthroughs we might have. But currently, this is a difference that is really worth mentioning because to me, at least, um, it says that um, if we can perhaps associate OCD with serotonin in some way, that we probably can't say the same thing about uh, hair pulling. So even though they share um, some structural similarities and functional similarities, they really are separate entities overall. Uh, so that's all I had for you today. I will stop now. As I said, I'm constrained by time. And as always, I also broke my own self-imposed time limit. But now I don't even bother to say anymore how long I'm going to talk because I never know. Um, if you have any questions, please email me or our support. They will be more than happy to answer all your questions. Uh, and if you were, if you haven't joined the program, but you could, you're considering doing it in the next seven days, you have a hundred dollar discount. So check the, the, the code below. Um, and unfortunately, I can't, uh, we will have to end now. Um, thank you very much for listening and sticking around. And please send your questions. I have set aside some time on Monday and I will answer all of them. Have a pleasant evening.